Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name is Max, and I am an alcoholic. I'm very glad to be here tonight. I want to thank uh, Charlie for inviting me and uh, thank my wife and uh, my support down here in the front row. And uh, I want to thank you as a group for uh, sending us uh, out to San Gabriel Valley where I live, sending us such a nice guy as Harvey A. You know, I have a good man in Harvey and uh, uh, we'd uh, be at a loss without him out there. I was talking to him before the meeting. I was looking at these plants, and uh, we had some nice plants like that out in Sabina. But some newcomers smoked them right before Christmas. And, uh, I uh, went to a meeting. Uh, my home group is in Sabina, five hundred two club. Um, 502 Club has nothing to do with uh, drinking and driving. It happens that our clubhouse is located at 502 Second Street. And we live out in San Gabriel Valley. And uh, we have a very large group. We have a banner on the wall that says uh, Sobriety Capital of the World. And some of the old timers in our group catch these newcomers and they actually convince them that that is the Sobriety Capital of the World. And I don't know anything about it, but I know it's nice to speak here to second best group in alcoholics and I'm I came out of a meeting recently and a newcomer that was at that meeting who went out to have a, another run at it said to me that AA was not excited and I said uh, where have you been going to meet you know I went to a meeting out in Covina in the 12-step house here recently, and I'd like to share this with you. In that meeting, it was a speaker meeting, and they had uh, two 10-minute speakers. One of the speakers was a girl that had just gotten off the bus from Civil Brand that afternoon. And she said that uh, as she was leaving on the bus to come out to Covina, she saw her daughter getting off the bus going into Civil Brand. And she said, at least I know where she is. Mm-hmm. And then they had another guy that spoke for 10 minutes, and he said, uh, I don't know anything about this schools and homes and houses and jobs and stuff like this. He said, the only thing I ever lost was my shopping basket. <laughs> and about that time, a three-legged dog came through that meeting, walking through that meeting named Tripod. And I sat there and I thought, my God, where would you go? Where would you go to sit down and see this type of meeting? You know? uh, I went over to a meeting in Covina, and it's a big book study. They read out a big book, and they uh, have a, a funny little program. They read for 30 minutes, and then they have a speaker for about 30 minutes, and they have a question and answer for 15 minutes. That night they were reading uh, Dr. Paul's story in the big book. And some of you know Dr. Paul. I know him. He's around our area quite a bit. And so he's very interesting sitting there and listening to him read. When they got through reading, the secretary said, I have a special treat tonight because we have a doctor that's going to speak, a young doctor, an MD. She introduced the alcoholic, and uh, I thought this ought to be pretty good, you know. Uh, he uh, identified for about 20 minutes, and uh, he was really one of us. You know, he passed out in an operating room. He puked on a nurse. He did the whole thing, you know, the whole nine yards. He was very good. And uh, then they got through, and they said, well, I have a question and answer. And this guy raised his hand, and he says, doctor, you being a medical doctor, as I recently read in the paper where they're uh, – Coming, trying to come out with a pill to give us alcoholics so that we can drink socially again. He says, as a member of AA 
and uh, a medical doctor, what do you think of that? And the doctor said, uh, oh, I, I read the same thing. He says, the first thing I thought was, what would happen if I took two? Yeah. He said, until they get that kind of thinking straight in the way, they're not going to get any pill for us. No. So, anyway, uh, I'm very glad to be here, and I, uh, uh, I'd hate to be around here if you guys uh, took two or three weeks off, you know? It's pretty rowdy here tonight. This guy's beating that gavel like he is wanting to get your attention or something. But uh, I uh, I was brought to Alcoholics Anonymous on June 15, 1966. Someone brought me to my first meeting of AA. Through the grace of the loving God that I found here and through people like you and some of you here in this room, 12 steps and a good sponsor I haven't found necessary to drink any alcohol go to jail and live the way I used to live for that I'm very grateful when I get a chance to share like this I usually have three things I'd like to share about I'd like to share about 14 years of my life that I didn't have any type of alcohol or drugs or anything to put into my system to take away some of the pain and some of the feelings and some of the things that went on inside of me and then I'll share with you about 22 years of using and abusing alcohol. To the point that I think that I became addicted to alcohol and became an alcoholic. And then I'll share with you about 28 years and some change here, one day at a time, sober and clean and alcoholic to none. Now, I didn't get here by mistake. I sure didn't get here for singing too loud in the choir. <laughs> I had my last drink of whiskey on Airline Street in Wilmington. Now, some of you don't know where Wilmington is, so I always like to tell you. It's a little resort area on the way to Catalina. <laughs> and I grew up in that town. And I ended up in there, and I'd uh, like to share with you the last drink of alcohol I had hope I had ever had. It was on June the 14th, 1966, in a flop house on Anaheim Street. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning, and somebody beat on the door, and I came to and let them in. It was a 16-year-old daughter of mine. She had a few choice words to say to me that day in the room, and I don't remember all of them, but I'll tell you what I remember. I remember that she was asking a lot of questions, and I didn't have any of the answers. She was asking real hard questions like, uh, why are you drunk every time I come over? Why aren't you working? Why aren't you taking care of the family? Why, why, why? And I had none of the answers. The only answer I had that day was a quart of whiskey and I poured a water glass full. And I tried to get it down and I got it in my mouth and I couldn't swallow it. I had to spit it back in the glass and I know that she was only in there maybe 10 minutes, but it felt like it was an hour. And before she left, she said, you know, it's a nice sunny day. And you're cooked up here in the room drunk. Why don't you go outside and set in the sunshine? So there's some chairs out there beside this building. Why don't you go out there and set in the sunshine and try to see what you're doing to everybody that loves you? And she left. And I don't know if it was an hour later. I don't know how long it was. I don't even remember if I had a watch. But I know eventually I ended up sitting out there in that chair beside the building and I had this drink and I tried to get it down and I get it just down in my throat and I had to go back in the glass. I just couldn't get my throat to open up to take that drink. I've been mixing a drug called Benzene Dream with the alcohol and, you know, when you come down off of that stuff, it's real wild sometimes. And I've, I've never had it happen before and if you're persistent, you'll eventually get one down, you know. That day I just seemed to couldn't get anything down. A guy came up and he pulled up a chair and he sat down next to me and he talked to me about this drink I had. And I don't remember this guy saying anything to me about uh, me. This guy had his shirt off and he had some big eagle tattooed on his chest and he had a coffee cup in his hand. And he had a smile on his face and he sat there and he talked to me about that drink and he told me things like, you know, I used to try to get them down the way you're trying to get that one down. 
I used to live the way you're living, Max. He said, I don't have to do that anymore. And he says, if you'll go back in that room, you don't drink anything more today, and you go back in the room, and he says, I'll come and get you tomorrow. And I'll take you to a place where you never have to have another drink as long as you live if you don't want to. Now, he didn't mention Alcoholics Anonymous, and he didn't tell me what time he was going to come and get me. He just said, I'll come and get you. And for a long time around AA, I told people I didn't know why I believed in it. But I think I know today, I think the, the language that we talk here in AA is the language of the heart, one drunk talking to another. And I think that's what Danny talked to me out there alongside that building for well over 28 years ago. And I think for a few minutes out there that I listened with my heart instead of my head. I believe I had to because knowing the type of guy I was then, if I had listened with my head, I think I'd have wandered off. But I believed him, and I went back in that room that day, and I, I don't know what happened that day. I don't even know if I ever got the drink down. I know the next afternoon all hell broke loose in that room. Probably two or three o'clock in the afternoon I came down and uh, things started getting bad. And I'll tell you, something came in that room and you could have cut it with a knife and it was fear. Fear moved in and I got to thinking, what if I go through this? What if I shake this thing out and what if I go through it and that guy doesn't show up? What am I going to do? I don't know what time he finally came. I know it was getting dark and I'd go to the window and I'd look out and he hadn't showed up. And I I know eventually there was a knock on the door and I talked to Danny about this later and he said we didn't say anything. But I just came out the door and went with him. We went down Anaheim Street a couple of blocks and we turned on a little street in Wilmington called Broad Street. Went down Broad Street to a union hall and we stood out in the back of this union hall and that was my introduction in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was 36 years old. I'd already drank up two wives. I drank up two homes out in Torrance. I drank up a job as president of Longshoreman's Union and I'd worked for all my life. And I'd watched all that stuff go and I still wasn't an alcoholic. They brought me into that meeting that night and set me down. I don't remember too much about it, but I remember a couple of things. One of them was that they asked, is there any alcoholics here? And I, did, I was the only one there that didn't raise my hand. I've heard people say they've been in AA for a long time and they never met anybody they drank with. It's not the way it was with me. I knew everybody in that room. Yeah. There was 10 guys in that room and I'd been to jail with them, fought with them, went to see long short. I, I'd worked in the maritime industry all my life and I knew everybody in the room. There was a drunken seaman in there that I'd been to sea with when I was a kid. See, I grew up in Wilmington during the middle of that popular war. And I ran away from home when I was 16. I went up to San Francisco and went to maritime school. And I started going to sea when I was 16 years old. And there was a guy there that I'd been on the ship with down the South Pacific when I was a kid. And Scotty was drunk in that meeting that night. And I remember he wanted to read out this book the guys had, and uh, they let him read out the book, and he cried all the way through it. The only feeling I had about it was I thought, well, any minute they're going to grab him and throw him out, you know. But he was reading and crying, reading and crying. Finally, the meeting was uh, over, and one of the guys leaned across the table, and he said, you know, I don't know why you came here tonight. He says, but I want to tell you why I came. He says, I came here because I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you know, I've never heard those words. I hear them in AA today all the time, but I've never heard them put together. And they, they just seemed to go together for me. On the way back to that room that night, I was thinking about, maybe that's my problem. Maybe I'm just sick and tired of being sick and tired. You know, the guy that brought me, this guy Danny, he apologized to me. He said that wasn't a very big meeting, and if you don't drink anything tomorrow night, I'll take you to a big meeting tomorrow night. He said there'll be 20 people there. He came and got me the next night. He, we went over to Long Beach, and we went down an alley behind a good world store in Long Beach. And back there in, in the back of that alley was an AA meeting, and that was my introduction into Alcoholics Anonymous. 
And I'll tell you something. I wasn't impressed. Those guys were impressed with me over in that little meeting in that union hall in Wilmington. They were so impressed with me that they let me make coffee for them for the next three and a half years. And I became my home group and I became the coffee maker. And that's the only thing I know for sure. Uh, we got good coffee at this meeting, but you got coffee makers at some of these meetings that should not be allowed to make coffee. That's, uh, that's all I know for sure. I uh, used to say from the podium that I didn't know anything about AA when I got here, and that wasn't true either. You know, I uh, grew up with a group of guys. Uh, we all worked in the maritime industry. We all went to sea during World War II, and we all worked around the harbor area. And they had a big uh, deep sea diving school in Wilmington at that time. I was the only one in the world. And these tough guys from all over the world would come down there and they'd try to get in that diving school to make those big bucks. And if you drink in a bar, you had to have a little click to hang together. And we had one. And we were journeyman drinkers. Huh? By that I mean that most of us would drink up a wife or two by the time we was 30 years old. We drank up some good jobs and some bad jobs. But we'd meet in this bar on Anaheim Street in Wilmington, a little place called the Christ. And we'd meet there, it opened at 6 o'clock in the morning, and we'd be out there about 10 minutes to 6, that uh, harbor area would come alive about 5 o'clock in the morning. You have four or 5,000 guys back there, and all heading for ships and working around the area. And we'd stop in for a few drinks. And you know, we'd yell at that bartender if he was five minutes late opening that place up. And we'd uh, meet in there sometimes... Uh, Two o'clock in the morning, he's closing the bar up and he's throwing us out the back door and we'd sit out in somebody's car in the back and we'd drink until the booze was gone. And if somebody uh, got a 502, uh, we uh, helped get them some money to feed the kids or bail them out of jail. If they went to the track and lost their money, we'd all pull in and help them till payday, you know. And we stuck together. We were a tight clique, and there was a member of that group, and his name was Jerry. And I'd been to tea with Jerry, and I drank with Jerry. And he's a good handicapper. I like to go to the track with him. He's a good bartender. He's just an all-around good guy. <laughs> One day, Jerry just disappeared. He never, ever came back again. And a month or two went by, and a guy came in that bar one day, and he called us all down to the end of the bar, and in a low voice like Jerry died, he said, did you guys hear what happened to Jerry? And we said no, and this guy said he went to Alcoholics Anonymous. I remember he said in a low voice like Jerry died. <laughs> you know? And after that, around that bar, when his name was mentioned, we, we spoke in a low voice like he died. And that's all I knew about AA. I had a friend, he went there and he died. You know? And I felt like I was dead when I was brought here. I was sit down in meetings down in that union hall and in some of those housing projects around that waterfront. And I'd sit in the back of the meetings when I was new. Because you hear different when you're back there in the back. You really do. Uh, I heard some very strange things from the podium when I was new. Now, I know that the newcomers probably don't hear them today, but I heard some strange things. I heard a guy stand up here like I am, and he said, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I only drink beer. I almost fell out of my chair. I thought, hell, I drink beer when I wasn't drinking. You know? And I don't mean to offend the beer drinkers, it's just the way it was with me. I heard another guy say that he came because he got a 502. And I thought, my God, why would anybody come here if they still had a car? Yeah. I wouldn't have came if I had a car. I sat in the back, like I said, and I heard this noisy back there, and I heard this guy say that he came to Alcoholics Anonymous to get his wife back. What I heard was he said that you had to get your wife back. <laughs> This is the truth. I sat through that whole meeting trying to figure out which one of my wives would have me back. <laughs> I heard another guy say that he only drank good whiskey. And I sat right up in my chair. I thought most everything I ever drank was pretty good. And it really was. You know, I drank some pretty rotten stuff. 
on an island in the South Pacific along the way of World War II, a 55-gallon drum went out under a palm tree. They'd throw pineapples, coconuts, and anything else they could catch in that drum. And they'd sell it to you by the gallon out of there. And we'd buy it, and we'd work on the ships, and it's out in that hot sun, and the mosquitoes was about an inch long. Mm-hmm. And on the third day that you drank that stuff, it was so bad that on the third day that you drank it, those mosquitoes quit biting. <laughs> True. They just light on you and they just fly away. They weren't no part of that. <laughs> and it was good. And I didn't know why it was good until I got here today. It was good because it was all there was. It makes a big difference. I heard a guy at a meeting the other day. He said, my drink of choice. And I said, oh, you had a choice? God, we're really taking chances on people today. today. You got a choice. Used to if you had a car. Now I think you got a choice. If you're new or you're fairly new and you're sitting in these rooms and you uh, think that uh, the old timers or the people that's been around here a while doesn't remember, you're very wrong. It's important we we remember. That's why I came over here tonight. You know, there's nothing I can say that from this podium to get anybody sober. There's nothing I can say up here to get anybody drunk, neither. Anybody leaves here and goes get drunk, it's because they wanted to get drunk. I believe that. But if I come over here and I tell you what I was like and what, I, what I'm like today, then I'm reminded of where I come from and who I really am and that this whole thing has been a gift for me. I believe that my sobriety has been a gift. You know, when I was new, I sat in these meetings, and these people talked about the steps. And I don't know, I know you guys don't the new ones don't have those problems today. But they kept telling me to work those steps, and I kept telling them, look, I've got the IRS after me. I'm behind in my child support. I got a union that I cook their books. I got people mad at me all over town. I don't need steps. I need money. You know? <laughs> Uh, let's talk about money. And they'd say, no, I just work the steps. And, you know, being the type of guy I was, I listened to, and I, I remember they read out of the book, and they said, these are only suggested steps. And I told somebody that one night. I said, these are only suggested steps. And one of the old timers said, yeah, but it's like a cop suggesting you get in the car. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm a product today, good or bad, of the 12 steps to program I've called Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you don't know where I really came from or who I really am, then uh, uh, it's hard for anybody to judge me. But I judge myself today on what I do around this program today, not what I did 15, 20 years ago. You know, somebody told me once, what you, what you do around here speaks so loud I can't hear a thing you say. I came over here tonight so that I don't get too smart sometimes and get too wise and think I've done all this stuff by myself or uh, with just me and some of my friends. I'm uh, very grateful. And by the way, I'm very grateful to uh, Clancy, too, for the uh, structure of this meeting. Now, I like parking down here having my special parking space. You know? I like being brought down and set down in the front row. You don't get anything like that out in Sabina, you know. Uh, it's like going to Santa Anita on Derby Day and have some third party. You know? Yeah, in a box, you know. Yeah. Where do you get that for just showing up, you know, just showing up? I uh, stayed around the waterfront for five years after I got sober. I had a uh, terrible time. And I thank God for the old timers that drugged me screaming and yelling right into those steps and gave me a chance to look at this guy I've been drinking with and living with. They opened some doors for me and freed me from some of the things that kept me drunk and kept me in that state of mind I was in. I uh, was down there five years and I uh, got a call one day and I'm still having a lot of trouble because I've made a lot of amends but there's a lot of people who are not accepting my amends. I was getting in a lot of trouble, and I got a call from San Francisco, and a guy said, uh, why don't you uh, come up to see us? We've got a job for you out in the San Gabriel Valley. I'm going to take you away from the waterfront. 
and I met with the guys and I moved away from the waterfront. I moved up to West Sabina where I live today. And uh, when I left down there, they told me, they said, you go get a coffee maker's job because you make good coffee. And I went over to 502 Club and I got a coffee maker's job in a men's stag that Harvey started a few years ago. That's been my home group for the last 24 and a half, almost 25 years. And I met people who I uh, got the program and uh, still had their car. I met people who some of them still had their jobs. A little different AA from what I was been brought up in down around the waterfront, but uh, I can say this today: when I got up there, there was five max in that meeting. And when I went in the first meeting and they asked me what my name was, I said Mac, and they said, "Oh my God, we got four of them up here already." And uh, they said, "Where are you from?" And I said, uh, "The Harbor area, San Pedro and Wellington." And they said, "Oh, the waterfront." So they nicknamed me Waterfront Mac, you know. They had Junkyard Mac, Waterfront Mac, Ball and Park Mac, you know. And it was fun, and uh, I got introduced to those guys, and uh, it's, it's been a trip. I uh, moved up, and I took a job with a large food company in the city of uh, industry. For the next seven years, I worked with them, and I negotiated all their contracts for them against the Teamsters Union. And I sat on the other side of the table for the first time in my life. I uh, had a boss named Chuck, and me and him got along real well. And we'd been there about seven years, and one day an Eastern outfit bought that company out, and they came out and they wiped us out all in one day. He came in his office and they fired him and me at the same time. And I'll never forget, it. Chuck looked at me, and I almost had a tear in his eye. He said, You know, I've never been fired before, Max. I said, God, I have. Yeah. <laughs> really ain't a big deal, you know. <laughs> I uh, cleaned my office out that afternoon and I put some books in my car and I had a big name out there where I parked my car and I ripped that off and threw it in the back of the car and for the next two or three hours I went through that company and I hugged people and people hugged me and I cried and some of them cried. See, I'd gotten to take a lot of guys out of a 12-step house over in Sabina called Crossroads. Old two story house supported by AA people in Cabina. It was a place where you could grab somebody off the end of a freeway or out of the weeds and they'd be alcoholic, you could get them some help without without any insurance. And I took a few guys out of there and put them to work for that company and I got a call about a year ago from a guy and he said, I just I haven't seen you in years, but he said, I just wanted to call you up and tell you that I just retired. And I got a good uh, pension, and I got good benefits. And he said, I want to thank you for taking me out of that 12 step house 21 years ago and putting me to work. And I I was thrilled by it, and then I hung up, and then I thought, and them suckers fired me, you know. <laughs> and uh, they did. And the day they fired me, uh, I left there the way he taught me to leave places. I went through there and I gave them all a hug and I shook hands and I left it just the way that you thought better than when I found it. I went over to 502 Club that afternoon. I got me a cup of coffee and some of my friends came in. They said, why are you here this time of day? And I said, I just got fired. And one of them said, God, that's great. Yeah. I said, that's great. What do you want to do? What do you really want to do that you didn't have guts enough to put a good job and go do and I said I didn't know, and I really didn't. But uh, I left there with those guys that day. And I ended up going back to school, and I ended up uh, getting a real estate license, and then I ended up going back to school again and ended up in the mortgage center. You can't get from where I started to where I live today and the things that go on in my life today. You just can't get there. You know, we're so used to miracles here in AA that we forget to look at our own sometimes. Yeah. Really do. I uh, went into the 502 Club one day about 19 years ago. And I met a red-headed Irish lady. She's a member of al -Anon. Her name's Kay. She's here with me tonight. She's my wife. I met Kay and I fell in love with her. And I was frightened to death because I thought I cleaned all that garbage up back in my inventory back when I 
was new in AA, but I found that it all came up again. See, I knew that I didn't know how to be a husband. I knew that I didn't know how to be a father. And she had a little three-year-old girl, and it frightened me to death. I uh, went to see my sponsor, and I sat down with him after a meeting over a cup of coffee, and I told him about Kate. I told him about this little girl, and I told him about the fear, and I told him uh, about it all. And you know what he told me? He said, you know, we've had you around here for a number of years, and we taught you how to treat people. He said, uh, I seen you in a meeting uh, when uh, newcomers spilled their coffee. I've seen you go clean it up and get them another cup of coffee. He said, take Kay and that little girl home with you. Treat them like you would a newcomer in a meeting in Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, you won't have any problem. He and I live up on the side of the hill in West Cabina. We uh, have a nice place up there, a nice little house. I've had big homes before, but we have a nice little house up there. I uh, got a place where I like going home. About four and a half years ago, I was out there mowing the, mowing the yard one day, and I had a heart attack. And I knew what it was when it hit me, and I it was, it was terrifying. I'm down on my hands and knees trying to get in the house, and there's nobody there, and I'm thinking... You know, I've heard people say that uh, somebody else, that your whole life passes in front of you when something like this happens. And I think with alcoholics, somebody else's life passes, you know. <laughs> but in my case, it wasn't that way with me. I uh, was crawling and You know what I thought about? And this is my thinking as I was trying to get in the house. I don't have time for this shit. <laughs> that was my feeling. I thought, I got some things to do, places to go, and I do not have time for this stuff. And I got in, and I got to a hospital, and I got a good doctor, and they take good, good care of me. And I retired a few weeks later, a few months later, and uh, I've lived some good life. I, I put 50 years of living in the last four or five years. And it's been great. You know, Kay... Uh, her parents, her grandparents came from Ireland. And a few years ago, I got a chance to take her home to Ireland. And we went over and ran into a little car and rode all over Ireland and went to meetings all over. And last year, we spent a whole month down in New Zealand. I was down there 28 days, and I went to 14 AA meetings in the 28 days. I don't take a vacation away from AA. I have today the things that I look for in the bottom of a bottle most of my life. And it's a direct result of staying around with you people, taking care of business here, and trying to be the best Mac I know how. You know, that's I can stand here and look at all of you right now tonight and tell you that I'm the best Mac that I've ever been in my life today. Maybe that's what I came to hear, you know. Maybe I need to hear that for myself, that I'm the best Mac i ever ever been. Alcoholics Anonymous will not solve all your problems. But Alcoholics Anonymous will teach you to live with unsolved problems and a quiet heart. Think about it. One more drink and we could have all missed this. Thank you very much. For that. My name is Joe. I'm an alcoholic. I'd like to thank Charlie for the opportunity to address my home group. It, it is an honor, as so many others who have come up here have said. <clears throat> now, if I don't get off on some wild tangent, to, I'll stick to the format and tell you what it used to be like, what happened, what it's like now. I grew up in this area uh, and uh, did a lot of drinking in the immediate area. <clears throat> uh, I started drinking oh, fairly young. I had a fascination with alcohol and uh, everything that surrounded it and uh, the people and, and what they did. And then it soon became apparent that a lot of people, when they drank, kind of lost all their inhibitions and were able to, to feel comfortable. And certainly was something I strove for because I didn't particularly feel comfortable uh, with myself or with my life. Um, so... The first opportunity I had to drink, I, I took it, and uh, that meant we stole some wine out of somebody's garage on the street, and 
three or four of us uh, got together and, and, and drank a bunch of it, and I got pretty drunk. Uh, we didn't get into any trouble, we didn't get caught, which was fortunate. Uh, a little later on, uh, my folks who, who do social parties quite frequently managed to buy cases of, of, of bourbon. And I got into a case of bourbon and took a couple of bottles and got good and drunk and was by myself in a bedroom uh, and wouldn't let anybody come in. Finally, I passed out. The next morning, I came out, and they all were very angry with me. I must have been 13, 14 years old. And from that point on, alcohol was not a mystery to me any longer, and I could drink with pretty much anybody I ran with and was always amazed at the guys I was drinking with when they'd get good and drunk and do stupid stuff, and I wasn't nearly what they had. Uh, it didn't lead to any real difficulty, alcohol, until I got to be about, oh, 17 or 18, and then... Uh, uh, it was in the 60s and drugs were included and uh, alcohol wasn't particularly a problem until you, you throw in a few traffic tickets and so forth that uh, you were able to pass off because you were not quite drunk enough that they were going to run you in. I got into the service uh, after finishing high school and college wasn't for me and because of my alcoholism really took off. I, I intentionally uh, went away out of, out of state, out of the state. Um, I went up to, to Alaska in an effort to get away from drugs more than alcohol. And Alaska is a drinking man's paradise. Uh, although you weren't able to get alcohol with any real regularity, seeing as I was see in a couple, three weeks or a month. When I got a shot at it, I got good and drunk and got in a good bit of trouble behind it. You think you'd learn, you know, I mean, you equate alcohol to problems, but it didn't seem to dawn on me. And uh, got out of the service <coughs> honorably. And uh, then the, the real trouble started. Uh, I was kind of on my own, and I, I had all these ideas of what it would be nice, like to be a hippie. Uh, so I let my hair and my beard grow, and I got kind of wild, and I drank whenever I felt like it, which was most of the time. Uh, I was going to school, and the government was paying for it, so that was quite fine, the GI Bill. And uh, every now and again, I'd get busted drunk driving and end up before the judge. The first couple times it was cute, and I was slapped on the wrist and given the old reckless driving, and it cost me a thousand or whatever. The last time, however, um, they sent me to a county program for alcoholics, and I was offended by that and uh, couldn't understand why they'd be doing this to a guy who was now a, you know, a junior at UCLA and had this worldly experience of the service and all that, and uh, I went down to this rehabilitation center, and, and they showed you movies and gave you an abuse, which I immediately didn't use, and they gave you uh, vitamins, which I did use. At any rate, um, there was a, a woman at this this rehabilitation thing that, that, that asked me if I, I had trouble with alcohol, and I told her no, that I, I you know, it wasn't. It was other things in my life that were creating the problem. And she really nailed me. She said, well, you know, why are you here? I mean, if you don't have any trouble with alcohol, you shouldn't be at a place like this. And she hadn't. And I, I really had nothing, you know, there was no answer I could give this lady. And, and it became apparent that I had a drinking problem. But I was unwilling at that time to do a damn thing about it. Uh, time went on, and uh, I met a woman, and, and we got married and had started having a family, or had, had a child. Uh, I never quite finished... Um, school at UCLA, I think I had one course to go, and I quit, essentially. I got a job, and uh, I worked, and uh, I'd go on these vendors every now and again, and go up and score enough drugs to make an extra four or $500, and it just drive me nuts. And I'd stay drunk. I didn't take drugs anymore. I'd get too paranoid. It drove me nuts. And, and mixed in with that, my health started to fail. I started getting pneumonia regularly. And I was just sick and uh, physically sick and emotionally sick, and I just I was an unhappy guy. So uh, somebody suggested I go to AA, and I went to a meeting locally uh, over in Brentwood. And the guys that got up there uh, looked good and sounded good, and I couldn't relate to the guy. I'm sitting back there. I suppose a few other newcomers on maybe here tonight said, this guy, you know, he, he has nothing that I have. I, I mean, he's, his whole thing, he's, he's got it together. And uh, I went back out after that meeting for two more years. I uh, 
came back to, to AA, kind of slithered back in and, and was going to other meetings. I kept slipping, so I called the central office and a couple of the fellows that were from in this group came out and 12 stepped me and uh, uh, they looked pretty sharp and I looked terrible. Uh, they brought me to this meeting and then they took me to a watch right after the meeting. And I, if there's a way I could have gotten out of that, <laughs> I'd have done it. But I, I, I really, this time, um, had, a, had a son and a daughter on the way and it was just essential that I get so uh, I, I then started to, to apply myself, coming to this group um, seven nights a week into the yard and, and moves and all the things that this group does. I got a sponsor and applied myself to, to try to stay sober and alcoholic anonymous. And uh, uh, it, it took for me uh, this time around. And uh, I'm forever grateful to this group for that. Uh, I Since then, um, my little kids have grown up and become... I guess somewhat bigger. They're 15 and 11. And I'm out every Saturday now uh, chasing kids around soccer fields or going to Boy Scouts, driving kids from place to place at night. And uh, I couldn't do none of those things um, if it weren't for the program. I've had the same job uh, for 16 years, which is a, a little longer than I've been sober. It's the job I had when I got sober, but it's been it's stability. I, I do the work and, and I... I'm able to, to get along with the people I work with, um, which is certainly something I could never have done prior to getting sober. I'd get a resentment, and I'd worked that resentment until I got even, or at least in, in my mind, even with the person that I had the resentment towards. Uh, I, I can't say enough for, for, for what Alcoholics Anonymous is that my wife and I are still together. Uh, we have a good relationship. We have a, a, a good family life. Boy Scouts is, is going well. I have a son who's who's about ready to become an Eagle Scout. He told me when I got here that I was going to be doing anything in that Scout world. I was I'd show you he's a nut. <clears throat> but he's he, it's it's been rewarding to me to see him uh, achieve in that area. He uh, he does well in school. He's a uh, He's a good guy, and, and uh, I, I don't take any of the credit for that. Uh, my daughter's a, a real sweetheart, and uh, she's a pleasure to be around. And the people compliment me out of the blue, um, who have had them on their teams or teachers in their schools. And it really is, it's, it's, what I have done is, is really tried to practice the principles of AA in my daily life. And, and to me, it, it, it's been a, a real success from the standpoint of, of my life and, and the life of those that I, I figure I touch. I want to thank you for having heard me out. Thank you. Um, our second 10-minute speaker is Eileen R. My name is Eileen, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. I'd like to thank Charlie for asking me to participate tonight. Um, it is an honor. I'm um, two years and almost six months sober. I uh, scared to death, and I'm <laughs> you know the fear that I'm feeling right now, where I can't figure out whether I'm going to throw up or pee. <laughs> kind of fear that I lived with all my life. And it is the fear that um, that helped me to get here. Um, I'm the youngest of four kids. I was born out in San Bernardino. And um, I know. And it's... Uh, I began drinking when um, I was about um, 13 years old, and I did it very recreationally. And as soon as I did it, it was wine with Thanksgiving. Um, I liked what it did for me, and it took um, it took my heart and slowed it down. It made me comfortable with my family and my relatives. Um, it gave me energy. It um, 
allowed me to feel comfortable inside my own skin. And that, like I said, the fear that I'm experiencing right now, I would drink, and this would stop. And I lived my life until I was 36 years old, looking for ways to stop feeling so afraid. And I was afraid of everything. I was afraid of people. I was afraid of going places. I was afraid of failing. I was afraid of looking bad. Um, and I often looked bad. And my father, uh, one of my father's favorites things to ask me was, what the hell is wrong with you? And he asked me this till I, w till I stopped seeing him. <laughs> and I didn't know what was wrong with me. I did not know. And I searched. I searched my whole life to find out what was wrong. But I knew what was right. And what was right was in a ball. What made me feel okay in the world and less like I had to fight everything. I, I envisioned myself as a warrior. Um, I was mean and I was angry and the only way to make it in this world was to put your shoulders back and barrel through it. And that's, that's the only way I could do it without a drink. As soon as I drank, I could be kind and loving and gentle and sweet and remorseful and um, I could listen to you without worrying about what you were thinking about what I was going to say after I was finished saying it or what my clothes were or yeah, all the crazy things that go on. I could slow down enough to hear and I could slow down enough to function in the world. Unfortunately, I could not drink all the time. I knew that there was a massive so social stigma about drinking while you're working, while you're driving, while you're banking. While... <laughs> and I didn't do those things. I kept very tight rein on, on, on what you saw me do in the world. And when I was out of control in, in terms of like when it was getting the better of me, you saw me angry. And you saw me being cruel or impatient or being like a fierce businesswoman. But that was because I was scared. And that was because I was really uncomfortable. But as soon as I got off work or, or you know, if I was going someplace on business, I would always stop in a bar. And after work in airports, room service, anywhere, so that I could be more of myself, so I could calm down and be um, safe. I never felt safe on earth. I had a very vivid imagination, and still do. I get in many arguments um, with my bathroom mirror and half the world, you know, so I'm getting ready. And um, I, I got to a point where I was um, weary weary of the struggle and the fight, and um, I had been to psychiatrists searching. To, I wanted someone to tell me what was wrong with me, and I wanted a, I thought a psychiatrist could do that. Then I got into metaphysics, and I thought that would be my solution. So I went and I searched my past lives, because I figured I was carrying it all over with me, and I, I was like fighting the wrong people. It's not the people that were here at present, it was like, you know, I, I never felt better, so I kept looking. I kept looking for, for another reason that I was the way I was, and the way I could never feel safe or comfortable. And um, that's kind of how I got here. I was, I was in therapy, I was working, I was doing all this searching still, and a friend of mine that I worked with um, occasionally asked me to come to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. And um, it was a philosophical thing that, that it was participation on that level. And we would argue about your principles and my principles and, and how we worked out the philosophy of living and who the real enemies truly were. Da, 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 da. And I would come and I would sit with her. And I thought that was nice for her. And then I would go home and drink and wonder why I felt so bad about myself and why. I just never could find a solution. 
uh, one Wednesday, for no particular reason, she asked me again to uh, to come, and she brought me to the Wednesday night meeting. She brought me here, and I stood out almost in the ivy at the end of the meeting, crying hysterically because someone from this podium, I have no idea who, said something, I have no idea what, that <laughs> I identified with, but it was way inside. And I was shaken. And I felt like, I felt like I was standing up here and I was talking to myself out there. Whoever it was, talked to me about myself and about what was wrong with me. And I began to look at the way I drank after that, and I looked at the people that went to jail behind drinking because of me, who, who were like heroes. You know, I'd crash a car driving, arguing with someone else. They'd pull me from the wreckage, and he went to jail. I ended up with a broken nose and black eyes and, you know, total company cars. And, and uh, I was very, very um, good about working until I got the flu, and the flu was really awesome. But everyone believed me because I was good at life. I was a thief. I, you know, I did everything that I never wanted to believe about myself. I stole from people. I stole from my parents. I stole from my employers. I behaved badly. I was cruel and unusual. And I knew it. <laughs> I didn't know what a sponsor was. I didn't understand that concept for me. And um, Anna pointed to a woman at, that had her back towards me, and she said, go ask that gal to be your sponsor. And that, that woman was Liz T. Uh, S. And <laughs> she, um, I tapped on her shoulder, and I, she'd never seen me before, and I asked her if she'd be my sponsor. And she said yes. I was thrilled. And she began the healing that has occurred in Alcoholics Anonymous in my life. She brought me through the steps. And she introduced me to a life that I would give up for nothing. I, um, I am so grateful I am sober. Most of the time I am comfortable in my own skin because I know that I'm not, I'm not doing it alone anymore. And not trying to figure it out. I have a way now of living on earth and feeling comfortable and taking the correct actions. I have, um, I have released myself from the, my, the victimization of, of my life. I made my amends and I, I did my four step first and then I made my amends and, and I gave my life to the care of God. And that's my bottom line. In fact, I cannot do any of this without God's help. And um, because of God, I got here. Because of God, I get to stay. And um, I'm lucky enough, um, tomorrow I'll get to stay again. Because I only decide one day at a time to do this. To again join you. And I, I really thank you for walking ahead of me. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.